My name is Lance Owens. I am the person that started art working. I like changing titles now and again. We all do the same thing here. We all work with artists and we all clean the bathrooms. I met Phil when I started a little before art working, a few years before art working, which I'm going to guess I probably met Phil around 2004-ish, I would say. But I knew Phil a good long time. I knew Phil a good long time. I'm Deborah Scheibinger, Operations Manager at Arts for All Wisconsin, previously VSA Wisconsin. First interactions with Phil was over the phone. We were preparing for Art Fair on the Square, which I found out was a huge deal for Phil. He looked forward to that all year, and he painted up a storm for that event, and he always was a guest artist in the booth. I first met Phil probably through doing the booth at Art Fair on the Square and became aware that Phil, like, within the outsider, like, even that far back within the outsider art, self-taught art, art community, Phil was maybe the most important self-taught art in the in the region who was living. Phil Phil always was like kind of at the at the top of like who's an important self-taught artist. Yeah. Patty Washinsky got me started in the painting in seven in seventy eight. She got me started. No one ever thought, no one planned for me to be an artist. It just happened. It was just something, Patty, when she, when she worked at the Opportunity Center, it, she encouraged me to take up, and I did it. I said, yes. And, I just, and she was the art teacher, too, at the time. I took art. In my 30s and 40s, close to being in my 40s, This is sort of the sort of the best, best of downtown, sort of the best. Duck Pond. This is the duck pond in Nakoma. It's it's what I call so to me it's home. My name is Teresa Palumbo, and I'm the uh, communications manager here at the Wasteman Center. I'm the liaison to the Friends of the Wasteman Center, which maintains the Harvey A. Stevens International Collection of Art by People with Disabilities. So Phil Porter is uh, one of the artists featured uh, in our International Collection of Art. He's been a vibrant part of our community, and uh, we have more works of art by Phil Porter than anyone else. Phil is such a character. Um, you know, it was always so fun to have him in the building. You know, he was uh, a, a man on a mission to see his artwork. If, if you've ever seen a Phil Porter piece, you know that it's very distinctive. Um, bright colors, vibrant landscapes. And fortunately for us in, in Madison, it reflects a lot of Madison well-known places and, and well-known buildings. We asked people to look for the two suns, which are so prominently featured in many of his works that reflect a son for him and a son for his great-grandfather. I figure one son stands for my great-grandfather, one son is for me. Phil was so much more productive when he could be talking to somebody. Phil always wanted to be interacting with somebody. And while he was interacting, he was just a steam engine. He would just, he would make and make and make and make and make. He would call and he would just start talking. He'd say, this is your good friend, Phil Porter. And he would just start talking about whatever was on his mind. He was extremely emotionally generous is that oftentimes in human services, people reflect on you're my good friend or you are my, you know, support person or you are my, and Phil always contextualized that differently. Phil always talked, I'm your good friend. I'm your good friend, Phil Porter. And he really was, Phil cared about what happened to the people around him. And so Phil was always checking in on people. And so Phil would call and be like, I just wanted to make sure that you knew that the belt line was all snarled up. So you might want to go a different way this morning. 
you know, he would see something on the news or something. He would call. He would call your cell phone. Just wanted to make sure that you knew that it's supposed to snow tonight. So you might want to consider taking a different route or something like that. But there was always like a Phil expressed his his caring to the people around him routinely. Uh, he was very generous like that. Is that he was very uh, comfortable with telling people that they were important and that he felt important to them, which I think was different about Phil. But everything was always, this is your good friend, Phil Porter. And he was sincere about it. That's really great. Wow. That's really great. Now we'd have to get some of the all, any of these pieces would have to be That's frames, tremendous. But yeah. Wow, this is so good too. Hmm. He really liked to talk about what he was working on and occasionally veer off into, you know, a holiday celebration or travel, a trip that was coming up. And, you know, I talked to Phil usually, you know, two, three times a month by phone. The Phil, I think, was the most productive when he was simultaneously talking to someone. And Phil needed an audience not to watch him paint, but to listen to him talk while he was painting. And he made a special point whenever he came into the studio of having a conversation with all of the people that he was close to. And so it didn't matter who maybe was working with Phil on a given day. Phil found his people each and every time that he came in. Phil didn't come into the studio without coming to my office, having a conversation with me. Um, and then I finally got to meet him uh, for Art Fair. He always had the nine o'clock slot for a guest artist because people really wanted to meet him and he had a large following you know we weren't supposed to have to open the booth and be ready for sales until nine but we would have people there at eight uh wanting to look through the porters and we would have you know anywhere between 40 to 50 uh porters and um they would be just rifling through gotta get my porter I, you know, and people would tell me, you know, how many porters they had, where they had them in their house, and just the joy that they got from the, from the, you know, experience of looking at the porter every day. So Phil never let anybody drift away. Phil maintained his connection to the people that were important in his life forever. And people didn't want to let go of Phil. Phil wouldn't let him let go. And people didn't want to let go. And the pilgrimage of people that came through groups and individuals two, three, four a day for four to six weeks. It was, it was people would come out of the woodwork, people whose names I knew from stories who I had never met. They all showed up. They all came in and they all showed up. And people who were just kind of legends in my mind from long stories that Phil had told me about this person or that person or that place. And magically, they all just appeared in front of me. Uh, he expressed, you know, um, his love of the Capitol because of his great-grandfather being, you know, a part of the architecture and design of it and other buildings. And so, you know, some people related to these being local landmarks and being, you know, Madison icons, some people just responded to the vibrant colors that he uses. And most often his palette was very, very warm with lots of bright yellows and oranges and just, you know, that type of palette people respond to really positively just really juicy brush strokes and you know it was just so um you know unfettered and i uh admire that so much that he didn't even really pause to think about things he just painted 
You know, what I describe about knowing Phil the person or knowing his personality or knowing his spirit, so much of that was like directly injected into his body of work that I think he did an amazing job, I think, of sort of conveying his essence through his work. Ultimately, I think that people were responding to the same things in his work that those who were close to him responded in, in his friendship. You know, you can look at it formally or you can look at it aesthetically or you can look at it art historically or stylistically and be like, oh, it has elements of this or he did this, you know, like he had lots of tricks in his bag. You know, as a, as a technical painter, it's funny because his work was often so juicy and loose and kind of, you know, on the surface, it looked real sloppy. But he was real sly and how he could compose things and how he could layer things. And he was really quite masterful with the layering of color, or creating kind of inferred space through, you know, particularly I love it when he like paint trees or he paint forests and things. Because he would use all different chromas and values of green to create this layered space. And they were all super sloppy. <laughs> and like, you know, on one hand, it looked like a giant mess. But on the other hand, it was like, but that really is a forest. And I get the sense that it goes back there for miles. Phil's artwork is so distinctive. You know, you, you talk about artists like Andy Warhol. Like, you can go into a museum and like, oh, that's got to be a Warhol. Or, you know, any type of impressionist art, you can identify who the artist is. And Phil's right there. His artwork is so distinctively Phil. I think his use of color is so vibrant and so rich. And I, I love how he captures what was important to him. Um, and so being a, a lifetime Madisonian to see, you know, elements of, of our community reflected in his paintings is another really wonderful um, snapshot of what it means to be in Madison, Wisconsin. I think that Phil someplace in there and it's really hard to, to pin it down because people were never disappointed when they actually met Phil in person. They would only increase their like, in connection to the work is that Phil was so much, he, he liked to say, I think I am my art, but it really was true that I really think that he, he put so much of his existence and his like his connection to local landmarks and local culture and his connection to local history, his own relationship within the timeline of local history, because of his connection then, you know, to his, to his, you know, great grandfather and so forth. But I think that, that he was able to really put that into the work. I think people really felt Phil in the work, whether they knew they felt him or not. I think they felt him in the work. commissioned a piece from Phil for the Waste and Center's 50th anniversary in 2023. We had wanted Phil to do um, a Phil rendering uh, of the Waste and Center in the same way that he has captured so many other uh, buildings in the Madison community. And so because he's been such a distinctive part of our collection and because I think people associate Phil Porter so often with the Waste and Center, we thought it was only fitting that Phil do a portrait of the Waste and Center for the anniversary celebration to mark that milestone. You know, it's a bummer because I think I think he probably could have finished it in the time that he had. But uh, he started it a good while before he passed and wasn't super happy with, I think, how he had laid it out. And so he had gone back and had redrafted a lot of it had reworked kind of like the orientation of the building and like kind of painted out and repainted and got it really nicely framed in. It was the last thing I think that he was working on um, because I think he had wanted to get it finished by the end of January or thereabouts. So it was on the easel when he left. It was, I think, the last thing he painted. This... Art, this vibrant art is coming from this little guy, you know, but when he started to talk about art or when he started to talk about architecture, 
you know, uh, you could see, you could see that sort of um, spark. I think he brought so much joy, you know, and he, he loved Madison and he, you know, brought that love to his work. And I think, you know, every person who owns a porter can feel that. You know, if those legacy, I think uh, there's so many different layers to that particular onion because there's so many different layers to Phil. Phil is really, really important to the disability community in particular because Phil's life follows a particular trajectory that kind of parallels the evolution of disability rights movements. Phil's you know, departure from, you know, when Phil was young, he ended up going to live in, I think it was Central Colony or Southern Colony. But basically it was a state hospital, the institution for people with disabilities. And there was a time where people with, you know, sometimes very mild disabilities just got, you know, shunted off to basically incarceration, living in a state hospital, which was not, you know, by all accounts, a good place to be for anybody but Phil leaves the hospital like so many people uh, did over the course of, you know, a couple of decades and, and moves into the community and puts down his own roots in the community and establishes himself professionally, both just within the regular, like, working community, but also within the art community. Your permanent collection or these things that are being put into the pool? These are put into the pool. When you think about what can a person with a significant disability be or become, and Phil breaks that mold and he shatters that ceiling, Phil becomes more than, you know, I hope to become. Phil becomes more, not only just for a person with a disability, but just for any person at all. Phil is more well-known as an artist. Phil is more celebrated. Phil is more loved. Phil is more remembered. Phil's, Phil's legacy there's a good chance that as time goes on, that Phil's legacy will be more memorable and more celebrated, more colorful than that of his great grandfather, who has quite the bouquet of accomplishments. But I think what Phil's legacy is something of, of, of the idea of becoming, you know, the potential to become. And I think that is a lot of his legacy is just how, how he overcomes so much to become Phil Porter. He overcomes, you know, the, the, the shining sun that is Phil. You know, you think of Phil as that painting of that sun or those suns. And you think of, of Phil as that bright shining light that he emerges from the darkness, I think, of the state hospital. And, and Phil emerges from that era and time and from that place with a bright shining <laughs> Just this kind of energy force. It's like rising sun. And I think that part of Phil's legacy and, and invariably is that people follow him, you know, people follow him into the workplace. Because Phil in some ways gives gives birth to to a whole generation of artists who think that they can. You know, that somebody like Mano would never maybe have thought that it was even a possibility or the people that support and surround, you know, some of these artists who are successful now, that the idea that, I, that that's a job, that that's a thing I can become, that I can become somebody. I don't think any of us had that framework before, Phil. For the state of Wisconsin, even, if you put a, like a, a, a peninsula Upper Peninsula. This would and but not this would pass for the state of Wisconsin. I don't know, not anything yet. But I've been. Just, I was just saying, you know, if, if I could do enough to it, I could probably pass it for the state. Of Wisconsin. It was a great last year. Spent a time with Phil. I really feel like, like, some of the best time that I had with Phil was in the the year before he passed. Honestly, he was in such a great headspace, and he was happy and he was somehow in the, in the like 
turmoil, that the rest of the world felt like it was being kind of sucked down the toilet. And somehow, strangely, and Phil, who was prone to anxiety even, managed to sort of find himself in the eye of the storm and just sort of, just sort of, he painted and socialized and lived and just didn't, that last couple of years, uh, he was making some of the best work of his life and he was happy and he was super centered and just like sharp. And I thought, Phil will never die. I thought, Phil, like, I remember thinking like, Phil's gonna paint until he's 100. Like, I thought he was gonna be like the Betty White of outsider art, because I just thought he's in such good shape and he's making such great work and he is so sharp. I thought, Phil will outlive me. And I had thought that thought probably three or four weeks before you, before we left. You know, a tree that size has roots that go incredibly deep. And even after the tree is gone, the roots persist for a long, long time. And how every every week, you know, every couple of days, we uncover more of Phil's evidence of Phil's presence. Here, how, you know, paintings will fall out of closets. Or how every day or every couple of days, there's a new, like, emanation of Phil's existence. Like, it'll be years and years and years before Phil stops coming up in conversation every day. Or it'll be years and years before, you know, we keep, you know, we just you open a desk drawer and there's this, some Phil postcards or you open, just he's, he permeates the whole building, both physically and spiritually, and how that will persist, you know, that'll persist for years and years and years. Um, I actually bought that piece because I wanted to see Phil every day. And so that is in my office so I can see Phil every day. Phil loved pie and coffee. If you ever really want to like celebrate Phil's, if you just to like have a few minutes and you want to quietly go out and like commemorate Phil's existence, go to Monty's, get a cup of coffee. If you really want to like emulate Phil, maybe even get decaf, but uh, but I won't. But uh, get a cup of coffee and, and get either like banana cream pie or lemon meringue pie, occasionally apple pie. But if you get the apple pie, you probably get the ice cream. That was living with Phil. Like if you really were close to Phil, at some point you had pie and coffee at Monty's. So.